Hi everybody, Captain Al speaking. Welcome to training tips designed to help make you a better, more knowledgeable flight simmer, pilot, or aviation enthusiast. Let's strap in and stow the HUD and see what is on the horizon for today. Our briefing today will cover the electronic flight instrument system. We're still talking about the PFD, the primary flight display. But now we're specifically talking about the altitude uh, display portion of the PFD and the vertical speed portion of the PFD. So what is altitude? Altitude is the height of an aircraft relative to X. X could be above sea level, above the ground, a true altitude. There are many different types of altitudes as we'll see. Remember when we talked about speed, we said that speed is life? Well, the old adage in aviation says, if speed is life, then altitude is life insurance. Many different types of altitude. There's indicated altitude. That's the altitude that's shown on your altimeter. For the airport with the current altimeter setting, it's usually expressed as uh, MSL or mean sea level. And that's if we're using a QNH altimeter setting. Absolute altitude would be altitude in terms of the distance above the ground that's directly below us. That will usually be expressed as AGL or above ground level. Radio altitude is a form of absolute altitude. It's measured by the radar altimeter. True altitude is indicated altitude in terms of elevation above sea level corrected for non-standard temperature and pressure. Pressure altitude is what we get when we go above our transition altitude. And typically we then set the altimeter to standard or 2992 inches. And everything then would be considered a pressure altitude. Density altitude is the density of the air corrected for non-standard temperature, pressure, and humidity. So as we learned early in our days of aviation, if you're at a hot, humid, high elevation airport, the density altitude will be much higher than the actual field elevation. If you're in Denver and it's a hot, humid day and the Denver elevation is 5,000 feet, then the actual density altitude may be much higher than that, let's say eight, nine, or 10,000 feet. And the aircraft would respond as if it's at that higher density altitude. How is altitude displayed? Well, most of the time it's displayed in feet, uh, or it could be displayed as both feet and meters. Um, one foot equals 0 0.30 meters, or another way of looking at it is one meter equals 3.3 feet. And if you're flying in most of the world, you're probably flying in feet, but there are areas of the world where meters are used, such as China. QNH and QFE are forms of uh, altimeter settings. QNH would reference the height above mean sea level. And if you use QFE, then the altimeter would reference your height above ground level. Uh, most airlines use QNH. Um, there are some airlines that use QFE. If you do set an altimeter setting to QFE, then when you're on the ground, your altimeter would read zero. If you set your altimeter according to Q and H, then your altimeter will read what your height is above mean sea level. So if you're at an airport that has an elevation of, let's say, 1,529 feet, then when you set the current altimeter setting for Q and H, it would show that field elevation. If you set QFE, the altimeter would read zero, uh, which would be your starting point. And then everything would be referenced off uh, your altitude above ground level, not above mean sea level. How is altitude measured in a jet? Well, it's measured with a pitot-static system, uh, specifically the static part of the pitot-static system. As we said earlier, when we talked about airspeed, there's Usually in the large jets, there's usually three systems, uh, one for the captain, one for the first officer, and uh, an alternate uh, pitot-static system. 
We said that the uh, static pressure from the static port will send a raw data type information to the air data modules. The air data modules then digitize that information and send it to the either the air data computers or the ADARUs, the air data inertial reference units, depending on the airplane. And then that information then is uh, spit out and displayed as altitude and altitude trend data that the pilot can use. Altitude displays in the past were on the round dialed steam gauges. Uh, today they're usually displayed on a glass display, uh, most likely a LCD type display. Older airplanes it could be a CRT type display. And on the primary flight display, usually the altitude display indication is found on the right side of the uh, PFD. As we said, the glass display sizes will vary depending on the airplane. Um, in more modern days, the displays have gotten bigger, uh, which is great for those of us that have uh, over 60 eyes or over 50 eyes or even over 40 eyes. The altitude display, as we said, is on the right side of the primary flight display, or PFD. It's a tape-type tape display, so if the um, display itself, the tape display, is moving from the top to the bottom, uh, you'll see the altitude increasing. If it's moving from the bottom to the top, you'll see the altitude uh, decreasing. Again, it's kind of like a rolling drum, if you will. Here's some of the symbology on the PFD altitude display uh, going from top to bottom. We have the MCP selected altitude and the selected altitude pointer. Uh, the common theme again is that uh, these are magenta, whether it be on your airspeed display or your altitude display or your heading display. Uh, the selected altitude is, is always in magenta. Uh, the MCP selected altitude is above the display. In this case it shows 3000. And in this case 3000 is off the scale. Uh, so as a result you see half of the half of the altitude pointer. If it was in range you'd see the whole pointer. The barrel pointer is displayed in green when you set your barrel minimums. It not only shows up on the PFD in terms of an altitude but it shows up uh, as a barrel pointer on your altitude display. There is a landing altitude reference bar that uh, when you get a thousand feet uh, above the reference field elevation uh, it will start. It starts out in white. You can see that here that it's white. And uh, then when you reach 500 feet above the reference field elevation it will turn to an amber color. So a thousand feet above the reference field elevation it uh, becomes a white bar and then 500 feet above the reference field elevation it becomes amber. Like right now you can see the reference field elevation is 100 feet and so at 600 feet it starts to uh, change from white to amber. The current ADC altitude is enclosed in the box. In this case it's 500 feet. And the crosshatch, a little green crosshatch next to the number indicates that you are below uh, 10,000 feet. So it's just kind of a, an additional warning that uh, so you don't misread the altitude that uh, you might think you're at 10,000 feet and you're really at 1,000 feet. Um, so the green hash mark will denote um, earth in a sense that you're getting closer to the earth. The touchdown zone indicator is uh, referenced by crosshatches, uh, an amber line and then crosshatches below it. And then of course we have the altimeter setting uh, underneath the altitude display. Just to the right of the altitude display is the vertical speed uh, display. Um, the vertical speed is uh, the ADC vertical speed. It is dampened by the IRS's as well. Anything less than 400 feet a minute uh, you'll just see the pointer. You won't see a digital value. Anything that's greater than 400 feet a minute 
you'll have a digital indication either above uh, or below the display. Uh, in this case, it's uh, we're going 700 feet a minute down. And the selected vertical speed that we have, again, will always be magenta. It consists of an equal symbol, a small little two dash, two, uh, two lines. Uh, and that would show the selected vertical speed, like in this case, it looks like it's right around uh, 1,400 feet a minute or so that we've selected. And right now we're at 700 feet a minute, probably on our way to uh, 1,400 uh, foot per minute vertical rate. Let's look at the virtual simulator. And again, we're specifically looking at the altitude display now, which is highlighted in white. You can see the selected altitude is 6,000 feet. That's in magenta. You have the magenta pointer. And you have the 6,000 foot magenta indication above the altitude. The current ADC altitude is 6,000 feet. We're in level flight. And you can see that uh, there are increments of 200 feet above 6,000. And each 200 feet is uh, listed or is uh, denoted by a number. So you can see 6,000, 6,200, 6,400. We're going to set the altitude window to 8,000 feet now. And we're going to climb using uh, flight level change. You'll see as we start to climb, the altitude display in this case is going to move from the top to the bottom and the altitude will be shown to be increasing. Um, I will pause the simulator here for a second to talk about something. Uh, this is a problem with the um, iFly 747-400 uh, simulator and uh, they do a great job by the way of accurately replicating this aircraft but this is one area they, they didn't do um, uh, an accurate job. Let's put it that way. It's still good, but it's not accurate. Uh, we're climbing from 6,000 to 8,000 feet in flight level change. That's a 2,000 foot change in altitude. Flight level change, when you use it, it attempts to get you there in two minutes. Um, so if you're only going from 6,000 to 8,000 feet, and you're going to get there in two minutes, and it's a 2,000 foot uh, change, then it'll give you enough power to give you a vertical rate of about a thousand feet a minute, roughly. Now you can see what's happening here is that uh, the power is just going to the reference thrust, which is climb one. And you can see that here, right here. It's climb one and it's going to that reference. And uh, the vertical rate is, you know, right now 3,000 feet and increasing. So it's basically going for the full reference thrust, and then the elevator is pitching up to maintain the speed, which the speed is 253, and the airplane is climbing at a high rate of climb. Uh, that normally would not happen in flight level change if you're going from 6,000 to 8,000. It would look at it and say, gee, that's only a 2,000 foot change. I'm going to attempt to get you there in two minutes. So as a result, we're going to give you about 1,000 feet a minute. And this power would only come up enough to give you about a thousand foot per minute climb rate. So that's a, that is an inaccuracy in the uh, iFly 747-400 uh, simulator. Again, very accurate in most areas, but there are some areas that uh, it's not like the uh, actual simulator or actual airplane. Let's continue the climb here. We'll see as we get uh, 900 feet before our selected altitude, we'll get a warning for that. And there we are 900 feet before. We get a thicker white box around the current altitude and we get a white box around the uh, selected MCP altitude. When we get 300 feet away from it, this goes back to a normal white box and this white box disappears when you get within 300 feet. So 900 feet before, it'll this will go thick, and you'll get a white box here. And in some cases, you'll get a horn, too. It depends on the option of the airline. I put that option in for this uh, particular simulator. I put that option in so you get the, the sound. You may have heard it in the background. You can see now that we've set 7,000, 
Notice it's off scale, so only half the indicator is displayed now. We're going to go to flight level change again. In this case, the uh, power will retard to idle. The airplane will start down. There's our 900 feet before. This goes to a thicker white border around the current altitude and a box around the selected altitude. When you get within 300 feet, so that'll be about 7,300 feet here. That'll go away. You might have heard the horn again. Okay, next we're going to look at uh, the setting meters. I'll just pause the simulator here again. If we push the meter switch, we will get meters displayed above the selected altitude. And we'll also get meters displayed above the current ADC altitude. So in this case, it's 7,100 feet. We can see we're at 2,163 meters. Remember, again, one meter equals 3.3 uh, .3 feet. So if you multiply this times 3.3, you'll get right around 7,100 feet. And we also have the selected altitude at 7,000 feet, which is where we're going. And that's, that's going to be 2,130 meters. So when you push meters, you'll get both meters and feet. When you push it again, the meters will disappear and feet will be left. We'll resume the simulator. And here we go leveling off at 7,000 feet, which as you can see is going to be about 2130 meters. And now we turn the meters off. Let's take a look at setting our barrow minimums. We talked about this when we were talking about the EFIS control panel, but remember when you set your barrow minimums, it shows up here on the PFD. But we also get the uh, altitude display, the barometric, uh, the green line on our altitude display. Of course, you're not going to see it now because if we set the barrel to 500 and some feet, it's going to be way below us. But when it gets on scale, you would see the selected barrel minimums as well. And of course, remember we talked about this in the uh, EFIS control panel section of the training. Okay, we're spinning the window down to 5,000 feet now. Now we're going to open the VS window and we're going to go down to a vertical speed of 1,000 feet a minute. And you'll notice the little double arrows here. It may be hard to see, but little magenta double arrows is the current, uh, well, the selected vertical speed. Notice the digital indication here showed up as you exceeded. Uh, 400 foot per minute vertical rate. You notice now I backed off to 500 feet a minute. And you'll see the digital value change to 500 feet a minute. If I go to 400 feet a minute, you'll see it disappear at 400 feet. Once you get greater than 400 feet, it shows up. In this case, you can see them at, uh, now I'll go back to 600 feet a minute, 500 feet a minute. You'll see once we exceed 400 feet a minute, the digital value pops up again. So our current vertical speed is this, and our selected vertical speed is the little magenta arrow marks. Now you can see I'm putting in 1,500 feet a minute, and our current vertical speed is going to equal the selected vertical speed here in a minute, and that digital value will increase to 1,500 feet a minute. Here's another, I'll pause the simulator for a minute. Here's another inaccuracy of uh, the iFly 747-400. When we go to a vertical speed of 1,500 feet a minute, you'll see I'm almost there now. And if you can see what's happening here, but the airspeed will be allowed, even though we're in the speed mode, with a 1,500 foot per minute vertical rate, the pitch is going to hold at 1,500 feet per minute vertical rate. The auto, the throttles, the thrust levers, will go to idle. When they go to idle, the uh, airspeed 
that's about all they can do. They can't go beyond idle. So once they go to idle, that's all they can do for the speed. The speed will be allowed to increase then. But you'll kind of notice if I resume the simulator, what's happening here is the speed's not being allowed to increase. You see how it's clicking back to 256, 257. It's kind of increasing a little bit. But this speed would be picking up right now faster than it is. Uh, it's kind of being contained within the uh, speed bug here, which is set to 253. But in reality, the speed would start to increase because you have a high vertical rate. The auto throttle is doing its job. It's at idle, but that's all it can do. So as a result, the speed would be allowed to increase. That's one of the problems with vertical speed is that there, if you if you have normal vertical speeds, you have uh, normal speed control. But if you it, if you go out of if you go to an excessive vertical rate, then the speed control will either the airplane will either slow down or it will speed up because the power will either be to idle or it'll be to the full reference thrust, and it can't do any more than that. So the airspeed may start to decrease or may start to, like in this case, increase. In this particular simulator model, it doesn't allow it to increase. It's pulling it back all the time, trying to keep it contained, and that's actually an inaccuracy. You can see here it's, it's, it's holding that 257. It's not being allowed to increase even though it wants to. And in the airplane, it would be increasing right now. It'd probably be up to 270 or 275 or something like that. It would be increasing with this kind of vertical rate. Captured the altitude now. Now you notice once we get back to a normal vertical rate, the speed is controlled. Let's take a look at the altitude indication during approach and landing. We happen to be at flaps 10. We're on an intercept to the localizer. You can see we're turning right now to a heading of, looks like, about 320 to intercept the uh, localizer course. For the purpose of the simulation, I've set up the uh, barrow at 572 feet. And I've also set the radio at 200 feet. Now again, most airlines would not set this on a Cat 1 approach. They would just set the barrel. Some airlines do set this for reference at 200 feet above touchdown, if that's what the uh, radio indication is, or a height above touchdown. We are level at 2,200 feet. The selected altitude is 2,200 feet. Our altimeter is 2,992. And our barometric minimums are set. Localizer's coming in. We capture the localizer. The airplane will turn inbound on the localizer course, which in this case is 343. Our heading indication automatically went to 343 heading as we captured the localizer. We're at flaps 10, waiting for the glide slope to come alive. Again, this is considered our four engine Maneuvering configuration. The glide slope is alive now as it fills in solid, so we'll go gear down, flaps 20, and we'll arm the speed brake. And we'll set our flap 20 speed. Our speed brake's armed. As we capture the glide slope, we'll go to flaps 30. Glide slope's been captured. So we'll go to flaps 30. And we'll set our flap 30 speed. The glide slope capture will also set our missed approach altitude. But you'll see that be set here pretty soon. And notice if we rest the uh, bottom of the box on top of the ref, that'll be five knots. 1500 feet radio altitude. 
we'll get land three. Uh, white box is kind of covering that. Uh, land three flare and roll out our armed. And I'll pause the uh, simulator here for a minute to take a look at this. You can see here comes the landing altitude reference bar. It's the white bar indication here that's a thousand feet above the uh, reference uh, touchdown field elevation. Uh, the Barrow is 572. It's still not in sight because it's off scale, but you'll see that here soon. Let's continue the simulation. Uh, we still haven't set our missed approach altitude, but we should have done that at glide slope capture. There it goes. I think we're setting it now. Now we're setting it. So missed approach altitude set. It was set late in that case. 1, We're a thousand feet above the ground now. I'll pause the simulation. Notice the white landing altitude reference bar is going to change to amber, indicating that you're 500 feet above the reference uh, touchdown zone elevation now. And now you'll see from the bottom of the display you have the Barrow reference now at 572. These are our minimums. We would be making callouts in reference to that. We'd call out normally approaching minimums as we get to 100 above those minimums, and then minimums as we get to those minimums. I'll freeze right here for a minute to show this that we are approaching minimums at this point uh, at 572 barrow at 672 we'd be approaching minimums right about in here there it is and then we'll get to minimums right here You'll notice the airplane ends up right on the landing field elevation, the crosshatch there, the touchdown zone elevation. Okay. That completes our discussion of the altitude display and vertical speed. Let's lower the HUD and go flying. Until our next briefing, keep the blue side up. Captain Al, out.